Another spectacular. Yes. I, <clears throat> great day for music, I must say. It's just fun to, when it's big like that. Scott, thank you so much. Everything is working so well. <laughs> Today we're going to, um, I want to talk about um, the spiral as applications, uh, 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 a spiral applica way of looking at the development of our uh, understanding of the divine and where unity lands in that process. So let me start by saying, <clears throat> uh, when I say spiral, I'm thinking of the, a coiled spring, essentially one that as it cycles around, it goes higher and higher. And uh, if you were with me any time earlier this week, you've heard me give this talk already. <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating, I'm saying it for the third time, but I think it's an important thing for us to discuss where unity is on this spiraling awareness of the divine. So in the beginning, when human beings were just becoming human and they were um, developing their sense of the divine or numinousness or, or the presence of some, something special, something non-physical, they probably first found a grove of trees a hill or a rock or something, maybe a spring, that they thought this place was concentrated. And so that became their focus of the divine. They would talk about the sacred grove or, or, or this mountain or, or, or something. Some, something is, something in nature held the, held the idea of the divine for them. And then as we developed uh, a little longer, we kind of spun around to the other side and we were making idols. So we made idols out of materials in the natural world. So we would stand up stones or we would carve something or we would um, somehow have an image here out of something physical and that would be our God. That would be how we would see our God. Then as society became more numerous and we bumped into each other we realized that our clan god which was the god at that time for us but now we were contacting other tribes and other groups and they had gods too so then there were many gods so let's say you're at, come at the time of the greeks and they have uh, all these different gods and different statues and the romans let anybody have their god as long as they would also worship Roman gods, and so we were kind of a pluralistic society. But there was also growing in another part of the world this idea of monism, this one god, only one, one god, right? Monas uh, monotheism, excuse me, one, one, one god. And that's a kind of a, now we're back to this, our god is now everybody's god. We've spiraled around, right? We're back to there's only one. First there was one, then there were many, now there's one again, but at a higher level, right? And then we spiral around again, so we, let's say that was Judaism, and then we come around uh, in the, around the uh, time of the prophets, and then we come around to Jesus. And Jesus becomes the new idol. He is God incarnate, right? So this is where God is, right here where Jesus is. I'm sure there's more theological nuances to that, but that became part of what? We captured the whole idol thing, again, in, embodied in one person was Jesus. And so that worked for a while. And then we keep cycling around, and, and people, many of us on the path, have kind of started out with this is where we were in our cultural development. We, we started right here, and Jesus was here. It was, Jesus was God, the Son of God, or God, depending on how we were saying it at the time. As we keep moving, though, many of us threw Jesus out with the bathwater, right? We went, well, there's more to it than that, right? He's just a person, maybe a great person, maybe an enlightened being, maybe a highly charged, wonderful Superman somehow, but God is something bigger. And then we, <laughs> so do you see how that works? Now we're back to the one thing again. We've kind of cycled around it. But we keep all of those things with us as we go, right? So um, 
We still think that you can have healings at Lourdes, right? Special spring, that works. Or we still have our amulets or our crosses. We still have our little Jesus on a cross, these idols. No offense to anybody, but we hold reverence for that in some way. We have Jesus, you know, we, we still have Jesus as the divine one. As, you know, we still have monism. We still have, a, 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 we recognize God in lots of different places. We keep spiraling around. We keep adding, even though we might be moving higher. So let me compare this to your physical anatomy. You were um, the pinnacle of evolution at this point. And the previous uh, brains of the previous dominant species are still here. So there's a lizard brain in you, right, at the base. Then there's a mammalian brain, kind of in the middle. And then there's a top of you, top of your brain and the forebrain. That's kind of your human part. And that is all, it's still there, all that stuff from the past. All your instincts as a, as an uh, animal, are still here inside you, even though you call yourself human. And so you have these centers of higher thought, contemplation, forethought. You have those possibilities, but you also have the instinctive reactions that came up with you through evolution. And the same is true on your spiritual level. You have the ability to spot the divine in a tree, to spot the divine in an image, to spot the divine everywhere present, to spot the divine in a divine person of Jesus, to spot the divine in all of us becoming one with the source. And we spiral around it. Ben, we keep both of them. We, I mean, all of them. We keep all of it. We are able to advance our thoughts, but we also still have our old ones as well. And that brings us to an interesting way of being in the world. So we're in the world, and uh, let's take forgiveness. So back when rocks were it, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That lasted quite a while, actually still is here. As you, if you've noticed the criminal justice system, you do something, you go to jail, right? Not so that you'll learn necessarily. Many times it's just to get back at you, right? It's meanness back. You mean, me, me. We get you back. Now we also have the penitence, where penitentiary comes from. So we have, we move around and we Say, if we kind of isolate you for a while, maybe you'll come to yourself and you'll see. So that becomes the reforming aspect of the penal system. Of the, but, but we also have the punishment side. Do you see that? Now, forgiveness is, keep, you keep moving now. As you do forgiveness, you can kind of do forgiveness from a superior point of view. Okay, well, I'm better than you. And so I forgive you. Anybody know that one? <clears throat> I forgive you. I'm better than you. And then we come to the one where we begin to see that, no, we, we actually have many of the same qualities just not expressed in that very moment. Sometimes we, we would never express it or have never expressed it, but it is still, it lays in potential within us. And it's not surprising if we've ever had the same thought that maybe we would like to do it. And so the forgiveness becomes more like, uh, one of, you're one of us. We, we both do that. And then if you keep spiraling around, you kind of come to the point where you begin to see that there's real innocence there anyway. And even spiral around even further and you begin to see that maybe there's really nothing to forgive in the first place. That what really was it was the fault, was our sense of separation from the divine. And you triggered a deeper, more painful experience of that by what you did. And so really it's with us to remember who we really are. So carrying that thought about who we really are, here's how we go in the spiral of who we are. We are the body. We are just the body. Survival is all about the body. 
then survival becomes not only about the body, but about our position in society. How many of us would go to, would, if you said something about my mother, right? Insults become, now we're moving up to the level of social importance here. So it was all about the body at some point. Now it's about your social position. Now as you keep moving, you'll see that um, who you are also becomes, you are your thoughts and emotions, and your, your thoughts and emotions are yielding to this idea that you might be a soul as well. And so now you're not just the body or just your social position, but you have an internal life, and that's who you are. And then it spirals around until you become a higher understanding of that, and you begin to realize that, hey, maybe you're really connected with everything, and that there is a, a universal consciousness that you are a part of, but you kind of get that on one level, but you don't get it all the way to the bone. And then you have a spiritual awakening, and you realize there is only one here, and you are part of it. And that this separate sense of self has been resolved. And this separate sense of self is the source of your existential suffering from the moment you thought you were a body to now, because all that time you thought you were separate from God, but once you reunite with God, now you do not have that sense of a separate sense of self, and all is well, and all are forgiven all the way around and back, right? So, who you identify as probably determines how you treat the world. Just using forgiveness as one example. And where you put your efforts. And where you put your efforts in life. So at one point, when you're starting out, <clears throat> it is, you are, you, as a human being, as an individual, you start out with the same idea. I'm just running around here on my body. And then somebody tells you, oh, no, no, you have a soul. And then you move around and, and you move, right? And, and you are progressing. But at the same time, you can drop right back down to it. Stub your toe. Who is their soul at that moment? <laughs> that has captured your imagination, right? Same is true social situation. Someone insults you in front of everybody and your standing in the community falls like a stone. Who are you in that moment? You're that fallen angel. So hurt. Why are you hurt? Because you forgot you really were the one and that you could be insulted. Now when we come back to Jesus, <clears throat> we see somebody in Jesus who was able to transcend that stuff, and he really does his best work on the last day of his physical life. Because in that time period, his body is beaten, he's insulted and humiliated in front of other people, and he's dying. And what does he say? Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. This is, you can take my body, but you cannot kill me. He is not that. He is something high. Can you see how that goes? But it wasn't long before this that Jesus, I'm going to just speculate, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but Jesus had one of those moments in which he forgot all that stuff, and he got really upset with everybody in the temple, and he made a whip out of cords, and he whipped people and turned over the money changers' tables. Remember that one? Where was he on that spectrum at that point? Not really sure. Maybe it was God's will, but maybe he just got pissed off. Took a social, physical position instead of a divine position in that moment, but it didn't stop him. And this is the point. You will too. You will have those experiences where you transcend your previous understanding. You will have those like, oh my gosh, really, I used to think that. And then you'll think, I've got it. Oh my gosh, I got it. I'm not, I'm not this body. Check it out. I'm not this body. Oh, my knee is killing me. Uh, right? Boom, right down. You'll think you understand forgiveness and your social 
position is unassailable because you don't define yourself as a member of society so much as a child of God. Until that jerk said you look terrible, whew, right down to the level of that, right? And that's okay, I just want to say. It's not your best shot, but it's the way it is. You re retain your reptilian brain, your mammalian brain, and your forebrain. You have all those things, and so at some point, one of those is going to get triggered, and it ain't always the first, the, it isn't always the highest one. Sometimes it's the first one. And it's triggered, and you begin to react. Your eye for an eye. Right? That's, but you will spiral up again. And the more time you spend up in the higher understandings, the better off you're going to be. The more you come from, speak from, act from your higher positions, the happier your life will be. But you will have moments in which you forget. Okay? It's natural. If it wasn't natural, then you could be condemned for backsliding. But it's natural to fall back into one of those previous positions. But it is admirable to rise and to continue to rise and to continue to look for the highest perspective you can hold and hold it for as long as you can. This is spiritual practice. Now, if you take unity in this process, what is this church? Why is it so hard to define what unity is? Why is it so hard to define even within unity what this church is? How many times have you been asked and you've really wanted to give a nice, clear, succinct answer? Right? Well, you have to be talking on the same, on the same part of the spiral to be able to communicate it in the fewest number of words. It becomes really simple when you're at the same level. It becomes different when you're at different part, when you're coming from a different place on the spiral. So if you are to make the, the point ex by the extreme, if you're talking to someone who thinks the rock is it, and you say, I think it's really, you know, I'm a transcendent being, and unity is about reminding me about that, you may not have a conversation. <laughs> right? And so it would be a long explanation to make it clear what y'all are mutually talking about. Right? And so... Uh, so that's why it's difficult. Now, on the leading edge of all experience, <clears throat> of your experience, you don't even know what the next level is going to be. You don't know. If you did know, you might be there already, but you don't know. So if you think about it, you, wherever you think you are on this spiral that I've described, try to tell me where you're going to be next. It's quite humbling. I don't even know what I don't know yet. I don't even know how to get to where I don't know yet. I, I, maybe I've heard of people who are enlightened or people who can walk on water, but I don't really know what that feels like or experience. I don't know that. I just like, maybe that's so. I don't know. I can't, I can't say it's so. I can say that I have come to this point and occasionally broken out, but I'm, you know, this is about where I am, right here, right about here. I don't know what I don't know. So take, for instance, my experience with Jesus. When I was a young person, Jesus was, I was told Jesus was the only son of God. That was his definition, the only son of God. By the time I was 16, I didn't think he was the only son of God. I thought maybe it was more spread out than that. By the time I'm like in my late 20s or early 30s, I don't really think about Jesus. Jesus is not there, no Jesus. Was it important? Kind of out with the bathwater, right? As I went through all the uh, seminary training in the Presbyterian seminary, he became even smaller. It's really bizarre, isn't it? Presbyterian seminary, my Jesus gets really small. He becomes a Palestinian Jew 2,000 years ago, living in certain social conditions under the oppression of the Roman Empire. He was a rebel, he was a this, he was a healer, he was a this, he was that. He was certainly not the son of God in that case. He was just a guy doing the best he could. Some people said he didn't even exist. 
He began pretty small. Comes around again. Well, he's a good teacher, really a good teacher. Comes around again, you st start to think in the non-dualistic point of view, and you go, holy moly, the guy was always there. He was one of these people who saw from a different perspective, go a little further, and he's going, look, I am God, and so are you. Holy moly, the whole column is expressed in this guy. He is at the top as far as I have met so far. There he is. Well, well you see, one day he's a winner, next day a loser, next day a winner, next day a loser. Do you know what I mean? But up and up and up and up. Sooner or later you get to the point where wherever you are, you see Jesus from where you are, not from where he is. Right? I once wrote a paper <clears throat> that said the biggest, one of the ongoing tasks for everybody in America was to define Jesus. And even if you're an atheist, you define him in some way, right? Even if you're of a different faith, you have to define him in some way because we have Christmas. We've got to deal with it somehow. A little bit, maybe, right? So, so he becomes the great reflector of who you are, not of who he is. As a kid, he's Santa Claus. As an older adult, he might be nobody. As a wiser uh, older adult, he might be somebody. At some point, he may be God, for all you know. Just like they said when you were a kid. Right? Who knows? It depends on where you are. And our awakening is this awakening from separateness to divine absorption where we become one with that. Where your conscious, the edges of your consciousness merge with the consciousness of all that is. And there is no existential suffering from separation. And you don't find fault with anybody because you've beyond, moved beyond that to someplace else. And this is the path that we are... <coughs> In, we in this church are looking for is how to go from I'm all about getting what I need to moving beyond need at all. And in this area, it is so green with novelty that most of us can say this quite honestly. I'm not lost, but I am exploring. I may be wandering but purposefully. I'm looking, and I will check out every text, teacher, intuition I have to find if I can move to the next place because I don't know exactly what that's like or I'd already be there. I am exploring, and I am open to amazing things. And I have gone from thinking I was mostly a body and all of my work really had to be like physical, mental effort to realizing that I can join with the divine and create really from my thoughts and feelings to realizing that I am more than thoughts and feelings and that I am already at that place of oneness with all that is. And if I can remember that, then I don't really care much about the rest because it's all handled. Or, like a stone drop right back to the bottom, it's all about heavy lifting. That's why your unity church is hard to describe. How do you walk into a conversation and go, I'm really thinking about becoming God? <laughs> that's where I'm, that's, that's me. How about you? What are you doing? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Being a good person. <laughs> How silly. <laughs> so, you're in a beautiful place. This is a, an amazing place because the way we have uh, tried to design it is that you're accepted wherever you are on this path, on this spiral path. And we don't expect anyone to be at the very top all the time. So wherever you are, you're accepted. And as, um, as we have said in other times and other places, we love you just the way you are and accept you just the way you are. 
but we're not going to leave you there. And that's the blessing. Both to be seen and accepted right where you are. And yet to hold out the promise that together we might go to a higher state. And we join together because we think collectively we have a better chance of getting there and we need the security, the home base, to give us the courage to take the exploration to the next place. Without the home base, without a sense of security, it's scary enough with it. It's really scary without it. And without some people who go, yeah, I kind of get where you're at. Completely confused and lost, right? That's how you feel? Good, you're probably halfway there. Right? Because some of them have been there before us. And they, they go, yeah, yeah, I've seen this before. I remember when my world fell apart. It just completely fell apart. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's why you're in community. They can hold you while you can't hold yourself. And they can love you even when you're foolish. Don't overdo it. But they, um, <laughs> they can love you and hold you and hold the best for you even when you don't even know what that is. And they may not either. And they don't have to. Because if you think, if you think you're in charge of your life, maybe, in parts, You can always be resistant, that's for sure. <clears throat> you have that thing. But what's pulling you toward it is the same thing you think you're looking for. It is God pulling you to him or her and saying, come on, come on back. Come back where you belong. Maybe we should do that as a song sometime. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. You went on this journey and you went so asleep. Now wake up. You're not. You're not alone. You never have been. And, you, and I'm always here. I'm always here loving you. And I lift you up when you've got nothing, if you will but let me. All along, the divine has got your back and your feet and your front. The last thing it seems to get is your mind. <laughs> when are we going to let it go and let it be so? When are we going to let it take us to the awareness that we are not separate, that we are love beyond understanding, that we are simply enough as we are and don't have to become anything else to be accepted that everything we have ever thought was unforgivable has already been for ignored. That we are children of the God awakening to our true nature. That's why we're here. That's why you come on a Sunday, just to be slightly reminded. That's just to say... You're not alone. Just to, just to tickle your need for the satisfaction of the soul and not let the world take all your thought process and all your effort so that you can be in this world, oh yes, successful in this world, but not of it. Not that alone. Not just the body, not just your social position, but one with the one. That's our goal. Let us pray. All about you. See if you can feel the space, feel in the space all about you the divine See if you can feel that divine. Recognize that this is how you recognize the divine right now. All around you. 
Now let it come into your body and be inside you as well. God is all around you and inside you. And this practice is saying, I, 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 this, I, that. This I can relax. And then you just see that it is just one. Just one energy, one consciousness, one presence. Granted, it has a focal point right where you sit. But that consciousness that says I is also it, the divine. Open and expand. And so it is. Mm-hmm.